where is it? Where is Bob? I think people should feel free to sit on the stairs. I'm sorry there aren't more chairs available. We didn't know how many people to expect, and this was the most available and congenial classroom. We have all come here to express our thoughts about Nilan Tiruchalvam, a man who gave his life for his thoughts and his beliefs, as well as to express our recollections and our feelings about his life and its sudden, brutal end. Most of us in this room knew Nilan either intimately, as within his family, or as a close friend, or as a professional colleague, over the years, for many of us, over the decades. It is wonderful that Sithi and Mitron can be here with us today. Nirgunan, unfortunately, has been held up by the weather and is at an airport distant from us. Perhaps our raging, disturbed weather and today's clearing are appropriate companion to the mourning of this death and to the celebration of this life. This memorial service will start with a few brief talks, followed by some music chosen by Sithi and loved by Nilan, and concluding in a period during which anyone here who wishes to rise and say some words is invited to do so. Our law school dean, Robert Clark, <coughs> is with us for this commemoration and wishes to welcome you now, Bob. Thank you, Henry. On behalf of the Harvard Law School, I would like to welcome all of you to this memorial service for Neil and Tira I am very impressed and indeed moved by the fact that so many of you who knew him took the effort to be here. Like all of you, I was profoundly saddened and shocked when I heard of Neilan's death. I had a direct interest in seeing him again. I did not really know him, but I met him when he was last year as a lecturer. I was looking forward to his return as visiting professor this year to teach two very important courses. We had quite a few students enrolled them in them on ethnicity, constitutionalism, and human rights, and a seminar on federalism, diversity, and group rights. We were all looking forward to benefiting from his scholarship, his thinking, his wide-ranging political experience, and from his commitment and courage. I know from speaking to uh, many colleagues a sense that uh, Nilan was a truly great human being as well as a scholar and an, a wonderful politician. I found myself when I heard of his death, reflecting on the fact that he got his SJD degree here at about the same time I got my JD, which made us affiliates in a sense. I psychoanalyzed myself a little later and I said, why would I focus on that? 
And the answer, I think, which would be true of all of us, is because when we're in the, the aura of a truly great person, we'd like to find a connection. We search for it. It's a good instinct. And it says a lot, not about us, but about the person we're trying to connect to. Through his visits here to Cambridge, his de getting a degree, his communication with colleagues, his teaching at the school and his occasional speeches and his plan to return, I know very certainly that Neelan was extremely proud to be affiliated with the Harvard Law School. I simply wish today, I wish with all my heart that we could have communicated to him how proud the law school is to be connected to him. Our next speaker will be Clarence, oh, will be star Stanley Tambaya. City to the children, spouse, partner in legal practice and political activism, veteran and Nurgunan, who is absent, who shared their parents' ideals, and friends gathered on this solemn occasion. Neelan Tiruchelvam was Sri Lanka's most distinguished constitutional expert and progressive activist. He was committed to creating a better and just world by constructive involvement in constitutional and legal reform, democratic institution building, the enforcement of human rights, including gender equality, fostering civil society, and crafting conflict resolution in plural societies. He was at the same time actively engaged in legal, political, and sociological scholarship. That this range of attainments had wider global relevance beyond the borders of Sri Lanka was recognized and applauded by various international agencies and earned for him the honor of being invited to be an international observer, evaluator, and advisor in conflictual situations. A major achievement was his election to the chair as the chairman of the Council of Minority Rights Group International, the London-based human rights organization. It is no wonder, then, that he was invited time and again by Harvard's law school, where he obtained his master's and doctoral degrees to teach and dispense his wisdom. In a fitting tribute, a Sri Lankan scholar activist has stated that Neelan was the main political link between Sri Lanka's Sinhala, Tamil, and Muslim communities. The bond that held together Sri Lanka's human rights community and a key link between Sri Lanka and the international human rights community. Neelan proved to be a consummate institution builder. He was director of the International Center for Ethnic Studies in Colombo and of the Law and Society Trust in the founding and designing of which he played vital roles. I myself was privileged to participate in some of the research projects and workshops of the ICES, whose members, many of them young scholars, irrespective of their ethnic and social origins, collaborated earnestly and smoothly in the study of relevant contemporary issues. One cannot exaggerate the importance of this effort in a country riven with ethnic and other social conflicts that have progressively distanced members of different communities from one another, the ICES was and is 
a microcosm suggestive of what, what Sri Lanka at large could become as a plural society of tolerant coexistence and common effort. I think that another level from his official constitutional and political work, Neelan was keenly sensitive to the need to re-establish trust and interpersonal links among Sri Lankans, Lankans who had become alienated. He knew that constitutional reform is of course necessary, but it is not sufficient. It has to be accompanied by the healing and restoration of inter-ethnic relationships, and this cannot be legislated by parliament. These remarks lead me to Neelan's creative labors towards forging a lasting solution to the violent ethnic conflict that has ravaged Sri Lanka for 16 years or more. He had been elected in 1989 to parliament as a nominee of the Tamil United Liberation Front, a party committed to, in their own words, unarmed democracy. He later accepted the invitation to serve as a member of the Parliamentary Select Committee on Constitutional Reform. Neelan was a commanding voice in the deliberations on devising a new constitution which would contain the proposals for devolution of power, which he considered to be an indispensable component for solving the ethnic tensions between Sri Lanka's majority and minorities and integrating them in a single unified polity. Be it noted that while engaged in this project, he was unyielding in his firm critique of the government's violations of the human rights of its citizens and of its other deficiencies in governance, especially in relation to minorities. I would like to characterize Neelan's proposals as constituting the nonviolent middle path and third way for reconciling a deeply divided society. Their import is that singular majority divided between two rival parties who repeatedly negate each other's moves towards settlement must join in bipartisan collaboration to endorse the devolution package. They must also face up to the fact that war, in order to reach a peace settlement, is a contradiction. On the other side of the divide, the LTT is also riddled with a major contradiction. Its quest of winning a separate state and of liberating civilian Tamils from inferiorization seems to deny free voice and choice to those very same Tamil civilians to express their ideas about an acceptable solution to the conflict. Forced silence backed by violence and by the threat of assassination is no match and no equal to free speech and choice in participatory democracy. This middle path and the third way requires that the government's army and the LTT's fighters renounce violence and negotiate for an honorable peace acceptable to both. It is not just one way and one option for attaining peace. It is the only way. It enshrines the best of Asian wisdom, such as nonviolence and the tolerance of difference, and the best of Western wisdom, such as social justice and participatory democracy. Comforting evidence is emerging from most from recent public opinion polls that the Sinhalese public at large wants a stoppage of the war and favors 
a negotiated settlement. It seems to me that this development is a wake-up call for civilian Tamils to stir themselves from their hapless passivity in order to voice their hopes and their wishes. Neelan Thirichelvam was a prophet who has prepared the way. In the full knowledge that he was vulnerable, a prospect which, we, which he and his family shared with quiet courage, he laid down his life as a martyr for the altruistic cause he passionately believed in. His legacy and his posthumous presence cannot be erased. Thank you. Our next speaker is Roberto Unger. Nilan Tiruchelvam had an idea and a passion. His idea was that we are all connected. His passion was love. Nilan believed that civilization grows out of trust. The core of his work as a jurist and as a statesman was to devise the practical arrangements that by recognizing and respecting difference would allow trust to grow. We are all, wrote Schopenhauer, like porcupines who huddle together against the cold, wounding one another with our spines. And then, going apart, begin to freeze and come back and forth until they find the middle distance. Nilan believed in the necessity of finding the middle distance, not as the end, but as the beginning. He understood that out of security and distinction would come self-possession. Out of self-possession, strength. And out of strength, magnanimity. His genius was to imagine the otherness of other people. And his craft was to develop the arrangements that would transform this imagination of otherness into a way of life. The ambitious schemes of transformation that I like to discuss with him, he received with benevolent skepticism. He understood from the beginning and intuitively what it has taken me so long to grasp, that these schemes come to nothing unless they are built upon the ground of human reconciliation. Nilan had to fight, to fight if he could without hurting. The fighting without hurting that Nilan wanted was untainted by zealotry or self-deception. Although Nilan was a hopeful and a faithful man, his love outreached his hope and his faith. Nilan was possessed by love. Love for his wife, for his sons, for his community, and for his country. Love for the individuals he met, 
whose originality, whose being as the originals they all are and want to become, he was able to acknowledge. The fighting without hurting brought hope to his country. To him, it brought complete life and violent death. Nilan's fate was to come to maturity in a country divided by fear and hatred. But Nilan was not the opposite of Sri Lanka. His country made him. Through him, it spoke in another voice. And in him, it signified its intention to become greater and better than it is. By this struggle to fight without hurting, Nieland kept living. 